and information. <clears throat> These seminars are put on uh, by Dr. Robbins uh, and Corey uh, to really give you the opportunity to get some important biomarker testing done. Uh, too many of us don't know about some of the things that are talked about. Uh, and we're going to go over that. And so uh, to go out and have it done at their doctor, you have to go, uh, wait a few days, come back, go to the lab, come back and get your results. And uh, if you don't have any insurance, then uh, you're looking at $300 for the test. And so the doctors made it very convenient. I'd like to congratulate them for making it so worthwhile. We're going to talk about uh, something called metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome affects more of us than we think. In fact, the CDC says that 62% of all the deaths that happened this year in the United States is caused directly or indirectly by metabolic syndrome. 62%. Now, if you think about that, that's a huge number. 62%. Um, let me fix my thing. I, Someone switched it here. 62% sometimes is a little bit of a misleading number. But uh, when you put it in perspective of numbers <clears throat> instead of percentages, then uh, it, it comes home a little bit more succinctly. 34% of the population uh, meet the criteria for metabolic syndrome. That's a lot. That's over three out of every 10. 20% of the males and 16% of the females that are under 40 years old. So it's not an issue that deals with just older people. At least now we don't consider people that are over 40 being old, right? 41% uh, of males, 31% of females, uh, 40 to 59, it does go up. Why does it go up? It's not because of age, it's because of duration. It's how long our body has been exposed to what causes metabolic syndrome is why it goes up. It's kind of like, <clears throat> is, does water uh, cause our fingers to get pruny and wrinkled? No, it's just the duration of being exposed to the water. So the longer we're in a the pool, then we get pruny, right? But as soon as we get in, we don't get pruny. And this is kind of the same way. The longer we're in what causes metabolic syndrome, then our ratios go up. And then it just keeps on getting more. And it's absolutely preventable. It doesn't have to be that way. It's not genetic. It doesn't get handed down from parent to parent. What causes hyperinsulinemia is called or what causes metabolic syndrome is called hyperinsulinemia. Now who here has children or has had children? And you've learned some lessons when you gave children sugary sweets after about 8 o'clock at night, right? What happens with when you give them a sugary sweet and them complying with going to bed on time? Yeah, it's a nightmare. And then, I mean, they're bouncing off the walls and, yeah, I'm got a new life and they're all over. So they're hyper. So what hyperinsulinemia simply means is that there's too much insulin in the body. More than what is needed. More than what our body's supposed to have to be healthy. And it is the root cause of metabolic syndrome. So when we have too much insulin it causes us to have hyperinsulinemia and hyperinsulinemia is what causes metabolic syndrome. And what it is, is the things that we're going to talk about here. <clears throat> These four scary looking characters are known as the four horsemen. The modern day health apocalypse. Okay? The four horsemen, as I'm going to introduce them to you, are high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high glucose, and being overweight or obese. That is what identifies metabolic syndrome. So if we went to the doctor and a person had any two of these four, they would have metabolic syndrome in any combination. Going back to that percentage of 62%, 62% translates to one and a half million people every year die from this metabolic syndrome. If we took all the soldiers that fought in all of our wars, it would still not add up to one and a half million. How many die every year? That's 177 people every hour. So since I've started talking, 15 people have already died from metabolic syndrome in the United States. It's a big deal. 
okay? And it has or is affecting everyone in this room's family or someone that they love if we don't have it ourselves, okay? So there's the percentages. So what Dr. Robbins is gonna do from the testing is we're gonna explain what it means to you and we're gonna identify how high the highs are and how low the, the, the average group is. On average, if we took this as United States in this room, this is how many of us will have these conditions because that's our national average. The CDC says that it is an epidemic. What's an epidemic? How do you define an epidemic? When you give the keys to your teenage teenager for the first time and they, oh, they come in later than their curfew, that's an epidemic because it just goes crazy. It's nuts. It's all the time, right? Epidemic means it just, it, it's growing at an uh, exponential rate really, really fast and that's what's happening in our country. But these issues are not the cause. Being overweight, high blood pressure, these issues are symptoms. They're just signs of what's really happening in the background that's causing it. So those issues are not the cause. So, um, Metabolic syndrome, is, in another way, is also closely relate, related to nearly all cancers. So all the cancers that we have are directly linked to metabolic syndrome. And you'll see how they kind of cascade and meet with each one. If a woman were to gain 20 pounds, now that's not a ton, from the ages 18 to 45, so they got a long time to do it, that doubles her risk of breast cancer. It's a big deal. Now that 20 pounds seems like a pretty big issue. Let's go and look at it another way. Uh, diabetes, overweight, okay, we're listing all the four. Only 11 to 18 pound increase over our, our, our ideal weight increases the risk of type 2 diabetes by 200%. We're talking about 11 pounds, okay? That's diabetes. Uh, another category to look at, 200% more common for those that are 30 pounds or more overweight, over their ideal weight. So, and, and this deals with high blood pressure. So you can see how they're all just kind of interrelating with a common theme, in this case, of being uh, of weight. So uh, one last one is that, uh, I need to fix my buttons here. Every two pounds over our ideal weight increases our risk of developing arthritis by 13%. So if we gain four pounds, it's 13, and then another 13% increase. So you can see it has that compounding effect on our joints of developing arthritis. So just a few pounds is, a, is an important issue. One parent that's overweight in the home increases the chances of the child in that home being obese, not overweight, but obese by 80%. It's a big deal, okay? So we've talked about metabolic syndrome and its relating cousins that we don't want to have over for our family reunion. This protocol and the, uh, the information that we're providing for you is based on over 600 clinical studies. Fancy word for clinical studies is that a lot of scientists over the last 50 years have studied this very, very well. They've identified, it's not one of those freaky sciences where it's just one study obscure in Iceland. It is well established and accepted in our medical community. <coughs> a simple test that we just provided will give you a guide of what your risk factor is or may be in the near future from metabolic syndrome, okay? So what caused our nation to be so <coughs> at risk of metabolic syndrome? Does anybody know what this looks like or what it is? It's called the food pyramid, right? Does anybody know where it came from? Oddly enough, people uh, think that when Moses came off the mountain and he had the Ten Commandments under one arm, that he had the pyramid under the other. You know, it, happened later than that. <clears throat> it actually was first in the United States in 1976. And it was just a guide. And uh, 
the guide has been distorted to sometimes guys, if you went to college or maybe in high school, this is what our food pyramid looked like. You know, if the foundation was fried foods, you know, pizza and spam, hot dogs, milkshakes, right? And then, you know, that was our, considered our healthy diet. We got all our vegetables from ketchup and mustard, right? Or maybe as adults, we've transferred our food pyramid to these type of foods a little bit too often. Okay, so regardless of the shape of the pyramid, the first one was just based in just a generalization. You know, let's, let's get some from the bread and cereal group, the meat group, the milk group, and let's just try to balance it out. There's been several changes to the food pyramid over the last 35 years. The one that was actually introduced in the national forum in 78, this is what it looked like. What I want you to pay attention to is how many or what the percentage of our diet and calories was in this category of carbohydrates because it's a very important role that it plays in metabolic syndrome. At this point, it played about 30%. So they're recommending that we have 25 to 30% of your calories every day come from carbohydrates. Now, what's a carbohydrate? Give me an example of one carbohydrate. Bread. Okay, bread, right? That would be a complex carbohydrate. Sugar is a carbohydrate, but it's a simple. It burns faster. So we have complex and simple. Okay? So any of the grains, pastas, and breads, and, and uh, uh, the sweets, uh, even fruit, okay? even though it's natural, it's still a carbohydrate. right? So here was about 25% of our daily intake was recommended. As we moved on, the big update was done in 88. Now we're looking at 35, 40% of the daily intake was from, from carbohydrates. Then it was updated in 92. Now we bumped up to 40% of our diet, 45% uh, in carbohydrates. The most recent one, it was just updated just a couple of months ago, 65% they are recommending come from carbohydrates. Now let's go back a little bit. If we overlay this topic that the CDC was talking about, this epidemic, we didn't really have a lot of obese people back in 78, 76. But the government was saying we are fatter than we were 20 years previous. We have more heart attacks. We have more cardiovascular events. We have more blood pressure and cholesterol issues than we did prior to 76. So let's do something to help our nation out. So they gave this recommendation. Every time they changed it, and increase the amount of carbohydrates, you go back to our CDC numbers of them gathering the numbers from around the country of how many people have high blood pressure and cholesterol and weight issues. It's gone up exponentially every time they've increased it. So we don't have to be really scientific to say that the solution is not giving us the result that we want. It's not to say that carbohydrates, these things, are bad for us, it's just that too much of it causes something that we don't desire. We eat these food because they make us happy. Who does not love, you know, a pizza every once in a while? Or, you know, chips and nacho and a candy bar, right? Every once in a while, a bowl of ice cream. Carbohydrates are not evil. It's just that when we eat too many of them, like 65% of our diet from carbohydrates, it will directly cause hyperinsulinemia in our bodies is directly linked to our food. So when I said metabolic syndrome, and I said the 600 clinical studies that say where did it come from and how to overcome it, they said that it's caused by what we eat, by too many carbohydrates, and we are giving ourselves this disease. This is an average American diet. What the study revealed is that it's not as important as where the, how many calories we're getting, but more where are the calories coming from. How many are from this group, and this group, and this group? The average American, and this is, by the way, 10 years, 11 years old, and it's getting worse, eats about 320 grams of carbohydrates a day. How much is that? I mean, let's, let's wrap that round in a pitcher. That's equivalent to two cups of sugar every day. Now, some of you might argue, I don't drink any sugar. I don't <coughs> take sugar. Once our body takes in a carbohydrate, whether it be grandma's triple grain bread or Pepsi's natural sugar pop, after it's broken down into a glucose, 
our body treats it the same as if it was white cane sugar. It's glucose now. Natural healthy carbohydrate, not so healthy corn syrup, it's still, at, after it's converted to glucose, is the same thing. One's more nutritious, but we're talking about what's happening to hyperinsulinemia. So when we eat nothing but healthy whole grain breads and we eat 300 grams of it a day, we're getting an equivalent of two cups of white sugar. It would be just the same, minus the vitamins, minerals. So again, I want to stress that carbohydrates are not evil and bad. It's just that when we have too many of them, it causes this issue. So going kind of back again, when we eat a carbohydrate, our pancreas, okay, this is what our pancreas looks like. If you just kind of locate your sternum right here on your stomach, it's right at the, the, about the middle of your chest, a little round ball, go down about two inches. Go ahead, don't be shy. Take your hand and tip your fingers down just a tad. Go into your body about four inches because it sits right behind your stomach, okay? That's where your pancreas sits. Now, the importance of what your pancreas does is that when you and I eat carbohydrates and it's converted to a glucose, it wakes up the pancreas and it secretes a natural hormone called, well that's out of focus, insulin. Okay? Insulin then flows through our, our veins. Now it's not a bad thing, we want to have the insulin because without insulin we would literally starve to death. You'd have a belly full of food but you, you wouldn't be able to use it. Have you ever heard of a diabetic not eating, but they have to take insulin shots or they would die? What they're saying is, is they'll starve to death because our cells have to have insulin and glucose running together at the same time. Because the glucose does not have the ability to bump up against our cells, whereas, which is where the glucose needs to go to get energy, and just be absorbed through the sidewalls of the cell. Can't do that. It has to be invited in. Or think of it like uh, the glucose channel, they call it, is a garage door. It has to be opened. What opens a garage door? Insulin. What? Insulin. Y yes. Oh. But the garage, garage door? door is the button. Yeah, that garage door opener or the teenager that first week of driving and they drive through the garage door. That also will open it too. So now, just for this demonstration, this is a garage door opener, that's the insulin, and this is the garage door. The insulin comes bumping up against the cell and says, hey, I'm here, open up, let the glucose in. Then the cell allows the glucose to flow in. Then it fills up with the glucose and you, we have energy, everybody's happy. But what happens if we have eaten so much carbohydrates, let's just say 320 grams a day, that our cells say, I'm full. You don't have to be a microbiologist or a scientist to know that our cells are only so big, right? Can they only hold so much stuff at one time? Right, so they can only hold so much glucose at one time. So they'll hold only so much, as much as they need, and the extra just sits out in our bloodstream and in our body. Unused. Our body does what with that extra glucose? It converts it to fat to be used later on. Our body does not have the ability to urinate out our unused glucose unless you're a diabetic that can't use it. It will urinate a little bit out, but most of it will be converted to fat, and that's why diabetics, in a large part, have a weight problem, okay? Also, blood pressure, also cholesterol. And what do we call that? Metabolic syndrome, okay? So, we don't want more glucose than what we need. So when we have too much of these healthy carbohydrates, it makes our pancreas work way over, way, way, way over time. Now you might be asking yourself, why didn't I have this problem when I was a teenager? I, could, I remember when I was working construction in the summer in high school, uh, remember when Wendy's first came out with that triple decker hamburger? I mean it was like they'd deliver it on a forklift. I mean the thing was, I'd eat two of those, large jumbo fries and a 
giant frosty. I don't even think they even have the giant frosties anymore, do they? That serve it in one of those giant pop containers. And I'd be like, you know, that's lunch. And I'd looked awesome. So why can't we eat like that now? Remember I talked to you about pruny fingers? It's not the fact that we have changed because we're older. It's because we've been in a hyperinsulinic state, wrinkly fingers, we were in the pool for too long, exposed to too much cholesterol or uh, carbohydrates for too long that gave us the inability to burn these uh, glucose cells properly. So these are all the issues that happen when we have a pancreas that is exhausted and tired. You have a lot of these symptoms. How many of you wake up after a big Mexican dinner the next morning and it's like, oh man, I gotta get me some coffee, I gotta get me a Red Bull, I gotta wake up. That's physiologically called a carbohydrate hangover. You just have a lot of carbohydrates left over from that previous Chinese meal, Mexican meal, Italian food meal, because there's just a lot of carbs in those meals, okay? And so feeling groggy, having a hard time concentrating. So you have a high carb meal at lunch and you go back to work and you're like, oh, I just need to kind of, I really have a hard time remembering my password to get back in my computer or what was two plus two again, okay? So those are all symptoms, plus many others, of too many carbohydrates. If you look at our pharmaceutical industry, they list the top selling drugs in the world they're all associated to metabolic syndrome. Number one medication in the world, over 300 prescriptions prescribed in the United States alone, but for blood pressure. Number two is cholesterol. Number six is for diabetes. There's three of the metabolic syndrome issues right there. And then the largest, uh, one of the very largest industries, uh, definitely in the food category, is weight loss. It's at $58 billion a year. So there's your four metabolic syndrome issues. So what is Dr. Robin's secret? How does he approach it that's different than anything else that you've ever heard of? Because what he's dealing with is resetting your pancreas. Once you reset the pancreas, the weight issue, the blood pressure, the cholesterol, and the diabetes are a non-issue anymore. Because that's what causes those to occur, is your poor little pancreas' tongue is hanging out, just exhausted. How many of us have been on a diet, we've been exercising, and we're just not getting the results that we want? It's not because they don't work. It's not because your body doesn't work right anymore. It's because your body is saying, I have hyperinsulinemia, and I can't, despite what you're feeding me, I can't, despite what your exercise you're giving me, I can't burn this extra glucose the way I used to because my friend, the pancreas, his tongue is hanging out and he's exhausted and he's putting out too much insulin. He's kind of crazy, he's dysfunctional. What he used to put out is to one unit of insulin uh, or, uh, for every 10 units of glucose that we ate, now he's putting out five and 10 and 30 units of insulin for every 10 units of glucose. It's not supposed to be that way, he's just got kind of crazy. What's fortunate is that the studies reveal that there's a, a very effective way to fix that. So the results of your test, Dr. Robbins is going to come up and, and talk about the numbers that you had. He's going to hand you your cards and explain what they mean to you. So Dr. Robbins, please come on up. You know what? Let me uh, pin this to you. There you go. Oh, great. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see you tonight because, um, you know, you ought to pat yourself on the back, actually, because, uh, you know, coming out tonight, such a beautiful night, uh, this would be a time that we could be out with our families and doing things, but uh, you're here. And the reason that I'm so here and away from my family, and just last night was my 21st anniversary, and uh, didn't even have a chance to celebrate my anniversary last night because I was working, so I, my wife is holding me to a big one this year, uh, is because I am very passionate about this subject. Um, it, it is something that I feel is so important and I give you kudos for being here as well. 
Now, when you came in today, we actually did a, a panel of tests, and I want to tell you a little bit about how to interpret the numbers and what they mean. And so what we're writing down here, actually, for this group, we're actually going to have the high and the low. And I'll explain a little bit. Sometimes the high is good and sometimes it's bad. Sometimes the low is good and sometimes it's bad. So I want to go over and talk about that a little bit. But as he's writing up there, I want to talk to you just a little bit about, and I want to ask you a question. If I would ask you, uh, uh, our current medical system today, would you consider them to be proactive or reactive? Yeah. Reactive, right? They, we, they tend to wait until something happens. Now that's not bad. It's just because we a lot of times don't have the opportunity to have these tests. So it's until you take the test and you're not in the range that they, that they feel that you should be in, that they react. Well, by your being here tonight, and the reason I'm commending you is because you're being proactive on something uh, that's very important. Now remember, we're talking about metabolic syndrome here. Now what were the four uh, things for metabolic syndrome? Cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, and weight. That's exactly right. I, you can think about it as the ABCs of metabolic syndrome. B, blood pressure, C, cholesterol, D, diabetes, and F, for fat, or being overweight. And that will help you remember. And the way we, d we determine if you have those, any two of those will determine if you, have, if you have two at the same time, a metabolic syndrome. If you have one, you're on the course and you will, it will get there. Now, as I mentioned, most of our medical, uh, the way our medical system is set up today, it's proactive, or uh, I'm sorry, reactive. And we want to be proactive. So the way I kind of think of that is, if we had a cliff, and we wanted to keep someone from falling over that, the way the medical system was today, they would put the ambulance down at the bottom, right? They'd wait for someone to fall, and then they're able, they're down there to do what they need to do to save their life. To be, to be proactive would be to put the fence at the top of the cliff. And that's what I'm about. I want to put that fence up there. Now, so we know that if they're at the top of the cliff, what we need to do to be <coughs> proactive, if they're at the bottom of the cliff, they're reactive. What happens between the time they're falling over? What, what, what do you do then? You know, I mean, we can put the fence up there and uh, as that person is falling off of that cliff, you know, the person down below can just sit there basically and watch while the person up above can sit there and watch. So what can we do about that? And the reason that I talk about that is, is because that's black and white pretty much, what we can do, what we can do for maintenance, what we can do to, to do it. But for those that are actually going over the cliff. And when we talk about health, you don't fall at the same rate that we fall today. You know, when we think about gravity, boom. As you're falling over that cliff, your body is trying to do everything it can, so it tries to slow it down. So who is best to be able to help that person? If that person is just falling very slowly, would it be the person at the bottom of the cliff or the person at the top? What can the person at the bottom of the cliff do as that person is slowly falling? <laughs> Try to catch them. How about the person at the top? Is there something that they can do to... He can throw them down a line, right? If, if he's falling slow enough, we can and, and bring him back. And so if, if these numbers, and if you find yourself right here and, you've, and you're going off over that cliff, it doesn't mean that you have to wait to hit the bottom to do anything about it. You can do it right now. And so that's what the exciting news. All of this is preventable. We can throw you a line. We can do something to bring you back up and over. And, and so, so let's take a look here. Um, on their blood test here, we took a look here at total cholesterol. Now, according to the medical profession, that should be less than 200. In this group right here, we have a high of 325 and a low of 167. So we can take a look and say, okay, this would be something that we would need to be concerned about. Now, is, is the 167, um, does, is he safe? Not necessarily, right? Because there's always, things can happen, and once you start on down this road, things can happen and, and that can change. So now we get to the HDL. Now the HDL is your good cholesterol, we've heard of that. We can think of that as healthy. So you want that to be above 40. The high was 70, and the low was so low that the machine didn't even monitor it. So if you have an NA on there, it's, 
it's because it didn't pick it up. Okay. Now we come over here at the triglycerides. We want it to be less than 150. The high was 650. The that low. That's good, by the way, right? Right. A low HDL, non-reading HDL. Oh, a non-reading, right, non-reading, because on, on your HDL, again, we want it to, you want more good cholesterol. We want it, we want it to be up. Now the triglycerides, we have 650 and a low of 60. Um, again, so now we have, we have a situation here that we need to be concerned about. Now the LDL, that's your, your bad cholesterol, or your L for lethal. Okay, we want it to be less than 130. The high in this was 114. The low is 95. Now, we take a look at that great. Uh, right here, we want it to be low. It would be the best and ideal and optimal would be in the double digits. So again, here would be a situation, if this were the bottom of the cliff, because that's the point where the medical profession would be reactive, correct? And this were up here, this would be even actually in the, in the uh, midst of falling. We have non-LDL, uh, or non-HDL uh, cholesterol, less than 100. We have 140 is the high and 108. Both of those there are, are not even uh, are there. So. Um, that's one of those cases where the roadrunner hits the ground and then and goes below right there. So we'd want to be um, mindful of that. Now, of all of these numbers up here that deal with cholesterol, this right here, to me, is the most important. This is your ratio of your total cholesterol to your good cholesterol. We want that ratio to be low. What that ratio tells us and what the medical profession uses that ratio to, to determine is your risk for stroke, heart attack, any type of cardiovascular type of event on that. So we would want that to be less than 4. The high was 5.5 and the low was 2.8. Now this 2.8 is great, but as I think the lowest that I have ever seen is 1.9. That is like optimal. I mean, that's nearly uh, no risk of cardiovascular um, uh, happenings on that. So, um, um, any questions so far? I've been pretty much doing all the, the talking. If there's anything, if you have a question, just let me know here. Okay, now we're getting into glucose. So right here. If the LDL is, is not applicable, what's going on there? Which one right here? Yeah, the LDL. Right here, the, this? Yeah. If it's not, I'm sorry? Applicable. Oh, NA? Yeah. It, it could mean a couple of things. It could mean that it's too low to be um, determined, or it could mean that uh, in that particular case that it's too high. So it's beyond the machine's ability. So it could be on either extreme. And the way that you can tell is by looking at the other numbers. If you're, if you're LDL, is way low and your cholesterol is pretty high, you can say that you're not, that this is not going to be a low number. It's and if you have a higher ratio, like he was explaining, if your ratio is a little higher, then that's an indication of, of what end your LDL is at that if you have an NA. That would, for example, if you had a above 4.0 and had it uh, on your ratio, but had a NA on your LDL, that would indicate that your LDL is high. It's too high for it to read it. Good question. Thank you. So <clears throat> that's all the cholesterol on there. So if any of those, again, if you have an issue in any of those, that would be one of those check marks. Say, okay, that's one of the symptoms of metabolic syndrome. Okay. So now let's, we're going to come down. We'll take a look at glucose. Now, you want your glucose to be less than 100 right here. Our high was 85 our low was 77. Now, as we take a look at this again, this right here, again, is the bottom of that cliff. That's, that's the point at which the, the doctors and the medical profession would be wanting to take a look at something and be reactive right here. Here's where we would want to be proactive because anything from 83 and above says that we're starting on that downward descent over that cliff. Which means what? 
which means that we toward? towards diabetes on that. So this, this would be considered kind of, I would call it a pre-pre-diabetes. That's not really a, a real term, but that's what, how I would say it, that if you were to continue on that without with that being unchecked, within probably four to five years, you would be up and over this and, and be considered diabetic by the medical profession on that. So you really, uh, the ideal, this, this is kind of in the ideal, about 73 to 75 is where you want to be on, on the glucose right there on that. Now, now we get to your blood pressure. Now the blood pressure is 120 over 80. That's considered to be um, normal and actually the World Health Organization is coming out and they're really now saying that they would like that to be more somewhere around 115 to 117 over 70, 70 to 75. They're lowering it, which is very interesting to me because that doesn't make any sense um, why that would be the case on that. So this is where we would want to be. So you want to take a look at your systolic, your diastolic. If you're above here, you might want to put another check check mark on that. And then finally, the body fat for men, men and women. Men, you want to be um, on this here. And this one depends on your age. Your age, yeah. There's a is there a. But uh, the median age of the average people uh, in Utah would put you right around about 20. But that puts you in a median age of 37. So if you're older than that, you, you're allowed a higher uh, body fat percentage. And women, you want them to have higher body fat. It's healthier for them to have. Now, did anyone do those? We do the blood pressure. Yeah, we did all of that. So you, you have all that information on there. You can actually, you can actually check on that to see where you are. So now, as you look at your own there, take a look and make a note. Okay, if you have two of any of of those four then we would say you would be a candidate for metabolic syndrome on there. Okay, now again, that's nothing to be fearful of. We, uh, knowledge is power. That's the reason why we're here and this is the reason why I do this. So that now you can see where you are and what areas you need to work in, with. And we actually have a solution for you on that. And so again, I applaud you for being here. If you have any questions, Jason's gonna continue a little bit more, but feel free to either talk to myself or Jason afterwards and we'll be able to talk with you about it. Is there any questions on any of that that you have before we go on? Okay, good. Um, well, not good that you don't have any questions. This chart, uh, if you look at your body fat percentages, it's, it's better and more accurate than your BMI. Who's ever done a BMI, body mass index? Don't you hate those things? Have you ever been in range? They don't distinguish between sex. They don't distinguish between age or whether you're an athlete working out now or if you're a couch potato. Body fat percentage is, is considered more in the medical community as an accurate uh, category. So the men are kind of in the green category, women in the purple. You want to be ideal depending on your age group. See, see, so as we get older, we're allowed a little bit more because generally we have less muscle mass. Not that that's desired, it's just that seems to be the trend of our nation. So you can kind of look at this, and, and then we'll pull this up later if you want to look at your numbers more. What is obesity? What's the definition of obesity? Before I worked for the company, uh, they asked me that question, and I thought, well, uh, the people on the, your, uh, the Biggest Loser definitely are obese, right? I mean, there's no question there. But is there any in between? I mean, what's the number? Is it uh, 50 pounds overweight? Is it a 75 or 100 pounds? Actually, if we are 30 pounds over our ideal weight, medically we're defined as being obese. And if we go back to those previous numbers that talked about the risk factors of just two pounds and 11 pounds and 20 pounds overweight, it, it provides some undesirable net effects. So we ask in our mind, how many diets have you been on? One three, five, or you're like this poor guy that can't keep track of how many diets you've been on. If you're a woman at the age of 40, on average you've already been on 21 diets on average in their lifetime. That's just too many, right? If you take uh, this gal here, so how many of us uh, women have played with one of these when you're little? 
How many guys played with one of these when you were little? Yeah, I know. Yeah, you can be honest. If we took Barbie and they done this with computer uh, simulation and blew her up to life size so she was a real woman, in order for her to maintain the symmetric design, she would have to be 6'9", she would weigh less than 120 pounds, her measurements would be 41, 20, 35, yes, she was born in California, more specifically Silicon Valley, and she'd be so far underweight that she'd not likely to be able to menstruate. Now, does that sound healthy? <coughs> Definitely not, but that's what young girls are sometimes subjected to. Guys, our young boys, don't have much of a difference. This is not Ken. Ken gets beat up by, who's this? G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe. Joe, when I was a boy, I played with G.I. Joe. I didn't play with dolls. I played with, what are they called? Action figures. <laughs> and they're dolls. Okay. <clears throat> so, the perfect body for a boy, if we blew them up, use the same computer scanning, his chest would have to be 55 inches. His biceps would be 27. You know how big that is? Arnold Schwarzenegger's in his peak. I mean, look at the size of those things. They have snow on the top of those biceps. They're so big. We're 25. G.I. Joe's in perspective, we're 27 inches. His waist would be smaller than his thigh. Now, does that sound realistic, or did maybe they taken some extra steroids in order to get that kind of a figure? Definitely not what is natural. I mean, hit the light there for a second, if you would, Keith. When I played with G.I. Joe, it was back in 1967. Look at that definition. I mean, he was buff. Look at him now. I mean, his six-pack has six-packs. That's what now our society determines that we have to be in order to be healthy. Definitely... The, uh, the idea is that if we look healthy, we are healthy. Again, I applaud you for taking the time for checking out what's on the inside, which is the true indication of our overall health. Really, what's going on the inside? What's your cholesterol? What's your blood pressure? What's your risk factors? Because it plays a lot more than what's on the outside. These poor women and the women of our society, this is oftentimes considered the optimum beauty which none of the uh, women can really obtain. It's not realistic, it's not healthy, and they've actually done a study that less than 5% of men even find these ultra skinny women attractive. And ladies, by the way, those 5% men are the ones that are currently incarcerated. So they're not really <laughs> possible candidates anyway, okay? So, uh, we're supposed to stay on this page for a while. When you think of the word diet, what are the things that conjure up in your mind? Yeah, party, I'm gonna have a good time, right? Okay, when we think of medication, having to take it, our doctor says we're gonna have to start you on medication, what are the things that conjure up in your mind in both of those categories? Diet, you think of that, I'm definitely gonna go uh, uh, hating food because it's not gonna taste good. You start with, uh, uh, you know, no matter what beautiful color they put the medication in, it's not gonna taste good, it's not gonna be desirable. Uh, one pill starts with just the beginning of many pills to the point where we become the pill, and when we start a diet, we're always hungry, famished at everything. The problem with that was that we become frustrated with what is a, what Dr. Robbins uh, suggested, was a treatment of the symptom, reactionary type of medicine that we have, rather than a precursor doing something about it before. And that's really what this program is about. Whether your issue is cholesterol based on your numbers, whether they're your blood pressure or diabetes, issues or pre-diabetic or whether they're weight issues. They're all caused by the same issue, which is hyperinsulinemia. So the studies revealed that there's a common bond to overcoming them, and he broke it into six categories that we'll just briefly go over. First one is protein, having a good digestible protein that our body can, uh, can digest. And so every day, the study said, our body needs half a gram of protein for every pound of lean muscle mass. So if we weigh 150 pounds, we need 75 grams of protein every day. 
What happens if you don't feed half of your children every day? The other half go to your neighbors to eat food, right? Not such a bad deal. But if we just stop feeding half of our society or half of our muscles, then some of those muscles are going to die, right? They're going to atrophy. How many of us feel stronger than we did when we were in high school? Okay, not many. Definitely, I mean, even these two that we listed here are not the average when we do a group of people. So this is an odd thing. Most of us feel weaker. And we're told that, why do we feel weaker? It's because it's getting old, get used to it, right? Of course you're supposed to get weaker. Or you're not as active. And so you're, you're just going to feel less energy. The truth is, the study said that because we're not getting enough protein, when you don't have enough protein, the muscle dies. When we don't have enough muscle, then we get weaker. We don't have as much energy. Our metabolism actually goes down because we're doing it to ourselves. Why don't we have enough protein? Because our diet consists of 65% carbohydrates every day. And that is playing the havoc on us. The next thing the study said is digestion. If we can't digest the protein and grandma's six grain bread and the fruits and the vegetables, then we're expelling that food without picking up the nutrients we really need. The number one health complaint in the, in the, the, the nation is I have a stomach ache. I, don't, I can't digest the foods I need anymore. So they said you need to fix the digestion. Then the, the purest uh, protein on earth comes from uh, New Zealand way. It's just the purest because they don't allow any pesticides, no hormones. It's just good, clean stuff. I mean, look at those cows. They're happy. You know those happy California cows? These are party cows. I mean, they make the California cows look like a bunch of whiners, criers, wannabes. So, we need half a gram every day for every pound of lean muscle mass. I have no idea what I did. Keith, can you come and refix this while I'm trying to fix it? Um... <coughs> So, next is nutrients. The study said that we need nutrients. How many of us have heard the story about vitamins and minerals? I mean, banged over the head. You've got to have those vitamins and minerals. But you may have also heard, thank you, that vitamins and minerals are sometimes just a uh, waste of money, right? Comes in one end, goes out the other end, right? And that can be true if you're not using a good property quality. But what's more important is that the USDA did a study, one of the largest studies, 50,000 people, and they wanted to measure how many of those people out of 50,000 were getting 100% of their vitamins and minerals just from the food they ate. Not from pills, not from castles, just from our food. And the study came out and said that not one person out of 50,000 we're getting their vitamins and minerals, recommended amount, uh, every day. And that was over 20 years ago, and it's worse today. So vitamins and minerals, the study said, is important for overcoming hyperinsulinemia, for overcoming weight issues and blood pressure and cholesterol, okay? Just a nutritional fact, one carrot in 1935 is equal to the nutritional value of 35 carrots today. It's not the farmer's fault. He just can't compete on a global scale where they're not putting the nutrients back into the soil again. So that means that we have to take it in some other form if we want to get it into us. The next <coughs> category, <coughs> excuse me, they said the emotions and the fat and fiber. How many of us are kind of bummed when we go on a diet? When we feel like we don't get the foods that we want, we're kind of feeling deprived and it affects our mood, right? It's a chemical hormonal issue. It's not just in your head. It really happens. So the study says you've got to deal with that factor. So in the protocol, what is provided, all natural, no synthetics, no artificial anything, this is the results from people like you that really, let's say that they wanted to address blood pressure or cholesterol or weight. They started on the protocol and these were the results that they had on just emotion. 30 days and 60 days. So they're asked to measure their level of fatigue, how they felt, their headache and pain, feelings of well-being. That just means how much did you want to go and hug a stranger, okay? 
after 60 days increased by 84%. Look at some of these numbers. Very impressive. Sleep and forgetfulness, irritability, the ability to concentrate. Some very impressive numbers. And it's really just dealing with the hormonal issue in our, in our bodies. And uh, then the fat category. Fats actually are important and vital. You just got to get the right kinds. The study said that we have to have what is called essential fats. Not all fats are essential. So on the protocol, you're actually given a fair amount of essential fats. Essential fats have been proven to actually give your body the ability to burn more stored fat and lower your cholesterol and help you with your mood and a lot of other things. So this whole protocol is based on these 600 clinical studies. Why? Because they're really smart people. They've done it for 50 years. What has happened with the protocol is just adopting it so that into a simple, easy to follow program. And then mechanicals is the last one. Fancy way of saying we got sludge and it's not good for us. The average American has 10 to 25 pounds of undigested food sitting right now in their bodies. Why is it undigested? The same reason that we can put food in our refrigerator for two months and it doesn't turn moldy. Or we can have <coughs> ketchup sitting in our cupboard for two years and we can use it. What is that stuff called that they put in there that gives us the ability to use it? Preservatives. Preservatives. So it's preserving it so well that our bodies can't digest it effectively. And so it just sits there called body sludge. And so uh, part of the protocol is a, a cleansing process. How many has ever been on a cleanse? Were you given that cleanse that you bought the bottle or the powder or whatever it was and they also gave you the running shoes to go with it because you couldn't be very far away from the you know, facility? This is a very mild, natural cleanse. You won't have to have any running shoes. The protocol that Dr. Robbins has and that, uh, uh, that Corey has is called uh, WIO diet or your weight is over your last diet. Remember the guy with the five fingers, 12 fingers? It's your last diet because you won't have to go back on another diet. The reason the previous diets didn't work for you is because you went on another diet. If you had to go on another one, then the first one wasn't effective. And it's really not a diet, it's just really an issue that's dealing with what's causing the dilemma. On average, the kind of results that you can expect, men lose four to seven pounds a week of fat, women lose three to five. Why do women lose less weight than men? It's an eternal annoyance. It's just not fair. It goes back to that muscle thing. The more muscle mass you have, the higher metabolism. The higher metabolism, the faster you burn off fat. So if we had a man and a woman and they both had exactly the same muscle mass, they would both have the same metabolism and would both lose weight at the same rate. So it's purely muscle. So women, if it bugs you, build more muscle and you'll lose weight just as fast. Hit that light. Before I worked for the company, I was 280 pounds. I lost 60 pounds in 11 weeks on the protocol. My wife actually got a, a ticket from the fishing game for having a, a, a sea animal on the beach without a, a license. Yeah, that's me. And uh, that's just one example. Corey, that you may assign, uh, you had your blood work done by Corey. Uh, and here, he was a trainer 